the Hop family spent all of November 1st, 1955, harvesting sugar beets on their farm in Weld County, Colorado, east of Longmont and southwest of Platteville. Just after 7 p.m., they were all eating dinner inside their farmhouse when they heard an explosion. It was powerful enough that every window in the home shook. When the family looked outside, they could hear the roar of engines and see a ball of fire passing through the sky. It seemed to be coming straight for them, and they originally feared that it would hit their house before its path curved slightly. 18-year-old Conrad Hopp ran out of the house with one of his brothers, but they lost sight of the flames as they fell instead behind some of the outbuildings on their farm. They got into Conrad's car, and their father and another brother got into a farm truck. They drove the two vehicles through the fields towards the outbuildings, dodging flaming debris as they drove. When they reached an irrigation ditch, Conrad had to park the car, and he and his brother continued on foot. Between the engine noises and the debris, the brothers had already realized that the ball of flames falling from the sky must have been an airplane. They were therefore not shocked to see the back of an airplane seat illuminated by the car's headlights when they got out of the car. Conrad's brother climbed over a fence and continued running towards the debris, before calling back to Conrad to go back to the house to get their coats. When Conrad turned around to go back to his car, he saw the front of the airplane seat he had seen from behind just a few moments earlier. He also saw that a person had been sitting in it, and that their body was still held in it by their seatbelt. Within moments of the initial explosion, hundreds of calls came in to the Longmont Police Department. People who were close enough to have seen where the wreckage had gone down raced to the scene to try to help. The chief of police in Longmont, Keith Cunningham, dispatched every police officer and firefighter in town to the scene and called in the Colorado State Patrol. He had initially also ordered every ambulance in Longmont to drive out to the crash site. However, when the first police officers arrived on the scene, they radioed in that no ambulances would be necessary. No one had survived the crash. The downed plane was United Airlines 629, which had taken off at 6.52 p.m. from Stapleton Airport in Denver, en route to Portland, Oregon. Eleven minutes after the DC-6B took off, the air traffic controllers in the tower at the airport noticed two bright white lights in the sky to the north-northwest of the airport. The two lights fell towards the ground together, and the controllers then observed a flash as the two lights appeared to reach the ground. The controllers immediately began radioing all known air traffic in the area. United 629 was the only plane that did not respond. All 44 people on board the plane, 39 passengers and 5 crew members, were killed. The victims ranged in age from 13 months to 81 years. 13-month-old James Fitzpatrick II had been traveling with his mother Helen on their way to Japan to meet his father, who was serving in the military and had been obligated to leave for duty the day after his son's birth. 81-year-old Layla McLean lived in Portland and had been returning home after visiting her stepson in Connecticut. Alma Windsor had been traveling to Tacoma, Washington to help care for her son-in-law, who was suffering from polio. James and Sarah Dory were on their very first flight, traveling to Portland to see their son. Airman Second Class Jesse Sizemore was returning to his Air Force base in Alaska after visiting his family in Alabama while on leave. Five children lost both of their parents in the tragedy. A temporary morgue was set up at the National Guard Armory in Greeley, Colorado, north of the crash site, and bodies were taken there as they were located. 21 of the people who had been on the plane had their fingerprints on file, either because of their employment, naturalization, or military service, and the remaining individuals were identified by their friends or relatives, or by their personal effects. The Civil Aeronautics Board, along with personnel from United Airlines, investigated the crash with the full support of the FBI, who sent an expert from the FBI laboratory to the site the day after the crash at the board's request. Hundreds of people from the area showed up to the scene, many just staring in stunned silence. Others helped with the investigation, locating bodies and helping with their recovery. Unfortunately, along with the well-meaning individuals who came to see what they could do to be of service, came the looters, who were seen stealing watches and other valuables off of the bodies of the victims. In response to this, the Weld County Sheriff's Office contacted the Colorado State College of Education in Greeley to recruit some of their students. 
Members of the Delta Psi fraternity came to stand guard around the field that contained the majority of the evidence from the crash, wearing their matching fraternity jackets so that they were identifiable to law enforcement. The full, primary debris field of the crash covered six square miles. The tail portion of the plane had been found on a farm a mile and a half away from the main crash site, cleanly cut from the rest of the plane. The size of the debris field was an important clue for investigators. When a plane crashes while still in one piece, it results in a relatively small debris field. The fact that the debris field from Flight 629 was so large, and the multiple pieces of its fuselage were spread over such a wide area, indicated that it had somehow come apart while it was still in the air. For some of the local residents who were present where the tail of the plane had come down, and were familiar with explosives because of their agricultural applications, the cause of the crash was clear, thanks to the distinctive firecracker-like smell left behind by exploded dynamite. The area surrounding the crash site was mapped out, and an extensive and detailed grid search was carried out, looking for pieces of the plane or items that had been on board it. Each item that was found had its location on the grid recorded before it was collected. The initial search area had to be expanded by several miles after hunters and other local residents reported finding parts of the plane and pieces of mail it had been carrying outside of the original parameters. The wreckage was taken to a warehouse at Stapleton Airport, where a wood and wire mock-up of the central fuselage of the plane had been constructed so that the pieces collected from the crash site could be affixed to it, allowing investigators to reconstruct the plane and to study where and how severely the fuselage had been damaged. The investigation quickly began supporting the notion that United 629 had not been brought down accidentally. No fatigue cracking or structural failings could be found, and records showed that the plane had received proper maintenance, and that any concerns raised by pilots about the plane's operation had been addressed. Furthermore, the reconstruction of the fuselage showed that the recovered pieces from the plane grew progressively smaller as they reached a point in the number four cargo hold. The fragments closest to that spot were minuscule, and much of the area surrounding it was entirely missing, indicating that some sort of explosion had originated from that location. The scent of explosives lingered on pieces of the fuselage from the number four cargo hold, as well as on pieces of cargo known to have been conveyed in it. These pieces and items also had smudges on them that looked like soot. Chemical analysis of the soot-like deposits by the FBI laboratory revealed the presence of chemicals that will be left behind following the explosion of dynamite. Some of the examined items also had residue containing manganese dioxide, commonly found in dry cell batteries. Eleven small pieces of material believed to have come from a 6-volt EverReady hotshot battery were found amongst the wreckage. Dynamite and batteries can be used in the construction of a bomb. As best as the Civil Aeronautics Board could determine from the various aspects of their investigation, the plane had been brought down by an explosion while it was functioning normally. They accepted the testimony of the controllers in the tower and placed the time of the explosion at 7.03 p.m. They believed that the second light the controllers saw was the result of the initial explosion causing a flare which was part of the plane's standard equipment to ignite and separate from the plane. The explosion occurred eight miles east of Longmont, Colorado, when the plane was approximately 10,800 feet above sea level, which was 5,782 feet above the terrain. The report and the chemical analysis was not available until November 13th, but on November 7th, six days after the crash, the Chief of Investigations of the Civil Aeronautics Board had officially announced that there were indications that sabotage had been involved in the crash of United 629. He further asked the FBI to open a criminal investigation into the case, which they formally began the following day. There were initial concerns that a labor dispute may have been the motivation behind the bombing. Flight engineers had gone on strike, and Samuel Arthur, a married father of two who worked as a pilot for United, was brought on to serve as United 629's flight engineer at the last minute. Brad Bynum and his pregnant wife Carol were only on the doomed flight because their original flight had been canceled due to the strike. They were on their way home to Oregon from Amarillo, Texas, where they had been visiting Brad's family to celebrate their first wedding anniversary. In addition to following up on the strike, the FBI began investigating everyone who had been on the plane, 
everyone who had reservations for the flight, but canceled them just prior to it taking off, and everyone who still had a reservation for the flight, but failed to report to board the plane. They looked into not only the passengers who boarded the plane at Denver, but everyone who had been on any part of the day's flight. Investigators were looking for indications that a passenger had brought the bomb onto the plane, or that one of the passengers had been targeted, with whoever made the bomb disguising their murder with the larger tragedy. Insurance fraud was considered a possible motive for bringing down the plane. In 1955, commercial aviation was relatively new, and consumer confidence in flying was not as strong as it would ultimately become. It was therefore not unusual for people traveling by plane to purchase travel insurance before their trip. It would take time for authorities to search the records of every insurance company that offered flight insurance, but some policies on passengers of United 629 were quickly located. It was relatively common at the time for airports to have vending machines, which dispensed flight insurance, so passengers could purchase a policy to provide for their loved ones, should their plane crash, just before boarding. The passenger would insert a few quarters into the machine, which would then dispense the policy documents. The passenger would then fill out and sign the paperwork, and deposit it through a slot into the same machine, to be mailed out before they boarded their flight. Stapleton Airport had such a vending machine. 17 passengers aboard United 629 when it crashed had purchased these policies. The amounts provided by the policies ranged from $6,250 to the maximum amount offered, $62,500, which would be equivalent to more than $600,000 in 2021. An unlucky occurrence in Chicago proved fortuitous for investigators in Colorado as they tried to identify the source of the bomb. United Flight 629 was a daily scheduled flight from New York to Seattle that made stops in Chicago, Denver, and Portland. The crew changed in both Chicago and Denver. On the day of the crash, a baggage handler in Chicago lost his keys. He believed he lost them while loading Cargo Bay 4 on United 629, so the baggage handlers in Denver were contacted and asked to search that cargo bay for the lost keys. When the plane arrived at Stapleton Airport, Everything was removed from Cargo Bay 4, with all the cargo not remaining in Denver being placed in other cargo holds so that the bay could be thoroughly searched. The baggage handlers never found the set of keys. As such, the only baggage in Cargo Bay 4 when the plane went down had originated in Denver, meaning the bomb had not been loaded onto the plane in New York or Chicago. Only a few pieces of passenger luggage had been put into the cargo bay at Denver. When they questioned the families of the victims, the FBI asked for a description of the items the passengers had been traveling with, and the type of luggage they had carried them in. One of the bags known to have been loaded into Cargo Bay 4 was a large, tattered suitcase reinforced with cables that belonged to a woman named Daisy King. 53-year-old Daisy owned a drive-in restaurant in West Denver and was traveling to visit her daughter Helen in Alaska for the holidays. Daisy had been required to pay a fee when she went to check her bag upon her arrival at the airport, as the suitcase was 37 pounds over the airline's weight limit. Her family believed that the ammunition she was traveling with, so that she could hunt caribou during her time in Alaska, was a major reason why the bag had been so heavy. Almost none of the items Daisy's family believed to have been in the suitcase were found amongst the debris, and only the smallest of fragments of the suitcase itself were located. This suggested that Daisy's suitcase had been the piece of luggage closest to the explosion, potentially because it had contained the bomb. Numerous items belonging to Daisy King were located at the crash site. However, they were found on or near her body, and were small and important enough that it made sense that she would want to keep them with her during her flight, rather than put them in her checked luggage. The items included $1,000 in traveler's checks, a list of addresses, personal letters, keys to and receipts for safety deposit boxes, and newspaper clippings about various members of her family. The clippings concerning Daisy's son, Jack, however, were not pleasant pieces of memorabilia, as they did not describe his accomplishments, but rather his criminal past. John Gilbert Graham, known as Jack, was born on January 23, 1932, the second of his mother Daisy's children. He had an older half-sister named Helen from his mother's first marriage. At the age of 16, Jack struck out on his own, forging his identity documents to say that he was older so that he could join the Coast Guard. 
He served from April of 1948 until January of 1949, and he was last stationed at the Coast Guard installation at Groton, Connecticut. He was honorably discharged after his true age was discovered, but a notation in his records shows that he had been absent without leave for 63 days during his time of service, meaning he was AWOL for almost a quarter of the time he was with the Coast Guard. Jack eventually returned to Denver and took a job as a payroll clerk at a manufacturing company. In March of 1951, he stole a checkbook from his employer and began forging the company owner's signature and cashing the checks at various businesses throughout Denver, ultimately stealing more than $4,000 from the company. He spent the majority of the money he stole on alcohol and women. The rest of it was used to buy a convertible, which Jack soon used to leave town. Jack's whereabouts during the next several months are unknown, but he ultimately ended up in Lubbock, Texas, where he was arrested on September 11, 1951, for hauling whiskey in violation of Texas laws. Jack was only arrested after he ran a roadblock driving over 100 miles an hour and was shot at by authorities. He was then convicted on the bootlegging charge and spent 60 days in county jail. He was then released to the Denver County District Attorney's Office to face a forgery charge related to the bad checks and money he stole from his former employer. He was convicted of the forgery charge in November, but was only given a sentence of five years probation after his mother paid back $2,500 in restitution, and he agreed to pay back the remaining balance in installments. Jack made his monthly restitution payments and visits to the probation officer consistently over the following few years. However, Jack's probation reports state that he did not appreciate the seriousness of the charge he had been convicted of, and that his mother was highly overprotective of him. Jack worked mainly as a heavy equipment mechanic and received his high school diploma after passing the entrance examination for the University of Denver. He was only a student at the university briefly, leaving the school with no degree, but with a wife, Gloria. Jack's stepfather, Earl King, died of heart disease on October 16, 1954, leaving his mother, Daisy King, a substantial estate consisting largely of property and various business interests. Following her husband's death, Daisy went to Marco Island, Florida to tend to a home she now owned there. In February of 1955, Daisy returned to Denver because Jack and his wife Gloria had just welcomed their second child. Daisy then purchased a home on West Mississippi Avenue, which was primarily to be used as the family home for Jack, Gloria, and their children. Daisy did create a basement apartment in the home, where she would reside when she was not traveling to check up on her various business interests. That May, she also opened the Crown A Drive-In Restaurant on South Federal Boulevard and hired her son to manage it. The FBI had interviewed hundreds of people connected to the passengers of United 629, searching for potential motives to harm one of them. This included friends, co-workers, and neighbors of Daisy King. At least three different people had told the FBI to investigate Jack Graham. While Daisy had provided Jack with a home and a business, the relationship she had with her son grew worse as their lives became more intertwined. Witnesses reported that Jack and Daisy fought like cats and dogs over business matters, and that Jack may have been stealing money from the drive-in. Insurance money seems like an obvious motive for Jack to kill his mother. He initially told the FBI that he had purchased three flight insurance policies, all paying out the smallest amount offered at the airport. He, his half-sister Helen, and his aunt each were the beneficiary of one of the policies. However, the FBI would discover the duplicates of these policies hidden in Jack's home during a search of it. While two of the policies were for the minimum amount of $6,250, the third, which listed Jack Graham as the beneficiary, was in fact for $37,500. Jack was also suspected of perpetrating other smaller insurance schemes in the months before the plane crash. In July, his new Chevrolet pickup truck was hit by a train just after Jack jumped out of it. Jack claimed that the vehicle had stalled on the tracks. He tried to convince his insurance company to pay him cash for the damages, but they refused, only paying for the repairs directly. Then, in early September, an explosion at the Crown A resulted in over $1,200 worth of damage to the restaurant. In the early morning hours of Labor Day, someone unscrewed a fitting on the establishment's gas line, which ultimately resulted in the explosion once the accumulation of gas inside the restaurant reached the pilot light of its water heater. 
a few dollars worth of change had also been taken from the register, and several pieces of furniture had been broken prior to the explosion. Authorities and the insurance company were suspicious of the incident, but the insurance claim was ultimately paid, and no arrests were made. The restaurant had still not reopened at the time of the crash of United 629, and Daisy was reportedly considering selling it. Other witnesses had reported to the FBI that Jack may have placed something in his mother's suitcase, a fact which he himself had not revealed in his initial interview with agents, when he claimed to have no knowledge of what was in her luggage beyond the ammunition she was bringing for caribou hunting. Jack's wife Gloria told the FBI that on the day her mother-in-law boarded her flight, she had seen Jack walk into their home with a gift-wrapped package that was approximately 18 inches in length, 14 inches in width, and 3 inches in depth. Gloria assumed that the gift was a tool set used for making jewelry. Jack had told her, and one of their neighbors, that he wanted to purchase such a set of tools for his mother as a Christmas present, because she enjoyed crafting items like small shells into pieces of jewelry. Gloria did not see her husband give the gift to his mother, but assumed he had, as she had seen him take it to the basement, where Daisy had been packing for her trip. The FBI grew increasingly suspicious of Jack Graham as the investigation went on. On Saturday, November 12th, 11 days after the plane crash, they called him and asked him to come to their office the following day to identify some of the small fragments of luggage believed to have come from his mother's bags. Jack and Gloria Graham arrived at the office the following day around noon, still dressed in their Sunday best from church that morning. After they identified the luggage fragments, agents informed Gloria that they wished to speak to her husband further about the investigation but that she could return home to her two young children, which she did. The FBI agents then questioned Jack about the Christmas gift for his mother. Jack claimed that he had never purchased the tool set he had been talking about, because he had learned that the set would not work for Daisy's specific needs. Seemingly unaware that his wife had seen him with the wrapped package and told the agents about it, he claimed that Gloria must have just assumed he purchased the set simply because he had previously discussed it with her. Jack was also questioned about the travel insurance policies on his mother's life, purchased at the airport just prior to her boarding the plane. Jack claimed that he must have thrown the policies in the trash at the airport, because he had never received the policy naming him as the beneficiary in the mail, as he should have. FBI agents then went to the Graham home and obtained a signed statement from Gloria, specifically about the details of her previous statement that did not line up with the information her husband was now providing. Jack was then presented with this statement and told that, based on the discrepancies between his statements and his wife's, he was being considered a suspect in the bombing of United 629. Miranda rights and the Miranda warning, as we know them today, would not exist for more than another decade after Jack Graham's interrogation, but he was advised that he did not have to speak with the FBI agents and that any statements he did make could be used against him in court. He was also told that he had the right to request an attorney at any time, but he never chose to. Jack did sign a statement saying he would take a polygraph examination, and another consenting to a search of his home, property, and automobiles. The searches were carried out immediately. It was during this search of his home that the travel insurance policy, valued at $37,500, was found hidden in a chest in a bedroom. Agents also found a small roll of copper wire with yellow insulation, consistent with the type used in detonating primer caps, in the shirt pocket of Jack's work clothes. FBI agents spent the next several hours interviewing Jack, sending out other agents to investigate what he said, and then presenting him with evidence disproving what he had told them. This cycle repeated several times. When Jack was presented with the evidence from the FBI laboratory about the fragments of wreckage recovered from the crash scene, Jack confessed, but not to the bombing of the plane. Rather, he admitted to causing the explosion at the drive-in and to intentionally letting his truck be struck by a train. Just after midnight, Agent James R. Wagoner told Jack, You've been lying to us all night. We are going to charge you with this crime. Why not make it easy for us? Jack replied simply, where do you want me to start, and confessed to building the bomb and causing the crash of United 629. He would sign a five-page statement confessing to his involvement. Between the statement Jack made that night, later confessions to prison psychiatrists, and statements made by Gloria Graham, 
We have a fairly detailed account of Jack's actions in the hours just before and just after the bombing. Jack had been working as a mechanic on the graveyard shift, following the explosion at the drive-in, so he had spent most of the day of November 1st, 1955, sleeping after a shift at work. He woke up just before 5 p.m. and began preparing to take his mother to the airport for her flight. Because she would be in Alaska for so long, Daisy was going to store her 1955 Chevrolet at the Denver Motor Hotel while she was away. Jack sent his family with Daisy in her car, telling his mother to leave her luggage for him to load into his car before he followed. After his family left in Daisy's car, Jack opened his mother's suitcase. He removed her bathrobe and a quilted lavender bag, which held Jack's wedding pictures and two antique brass flasks from the suitcase. In place of those items, he placed a bomb he had previously constructed, which was made of 25 sticks of dynamite, two blasting caps, a timer, and a six-volt battery. One stick of dynamite would have been enough to bring down the plane his mother was about to board. He included two blasting caps, just in case one failed. Jack then loaded the luggage into his own car and began driving to meet his family. They got into his car at the motor hotel and began driving to the airport. Daisy thought it took her son too long to finally meet them at the motor hotel and was concerned he was going to make her miss her 6.30 flight. When they reached the airport, Jack dropped Daisy, Gloria, and his children off at the terminal before going to park his car. As Jack was taking his mother's luggage out of the car, he reached into his mother's suitcase and turned the dial on the timer connected to the bomb. He brought the suitcase into the airport and carried it to the check-in desk for his mother. Daisy was upset to learn the bag was 37 pounds over the airline's weight limit, and she would be required to pay a $27 fine in order to have it loaded onto the plane. She briefly considered removing some of the items from the suitcase and having them shipped to Alaska, but Jack convinced her that she would need all of her things upon her arrival. Daisy paid the fee, and the suitcase was loaded into Cargo Bay 4 of United 629. After purchasing flight insurance at the airport's vending machine, the family went to the boarding gate. There, Gloria Graham recognized Sally Schofield, with whom she had attended a Methodist church camp a few years earlier. 24-year-old Sally was less than a month away from her wedding to a pilot for United. Sally also worked for the airline as a stewardess, but was off-duty and traveling as a passenger that day. She was traveling with another off-duty stewardess, Barbara Cruz, to Barbara's hometown of Seattle. Jack, Gloria, and their children watched Daisy board her plane and went to the observation deck to watch it take off. They then went to dinner in the airport coffee shop. After he ate, Jack went to the bathroom and threw up. As the Grams were leaving, they overheard an employee mention something about a plane crash. When they asked him about it, he had no further information, beyond the fact that he had heard that the plane had been flying for United. Jack called the airline after he arrived home to confirm his mother's plane had in fact gone down. He was the first relative of a United 629 passenger to inquire about the fate of the flight. An airline official informed him that United 629 had in fact crashed and that all on board, including his mother, were presumed dead. Well, that's the way it goes, Jack said in response to the news. The United agent called the Graham home back half an hour later to obtain more information about Daisy King. Gloria Graham answered the call. When the agent asked to speak with her husband, she told him Jack was unavailable. He had gone to bed right after being told of his mother's death and was already sound asleep. Based on the nature of Jack's criminal history and his admitted propensity for insurance fraud, money would appear to be his obvious motive for bombing the plane. In addition to the insurance policy, Jack also stood to inherit a large portion of his mother's estate upon her death. Daisy's estate was valued at between $100,000 and $150,000, which would be equivalent to one to one and a half million dollars today. While the money he would receive if his mother died almost certainly played a role in his decision to bomb the plane, he also had a personal motive to want to kill his mother. When describing watching the plane take off, knowing that his mother and everyone else on board it would soon be dead, he told the FBI agents, I watched her go off for the last time. I felt happier than I ever felt in my life. While Daisy was involved in almost every aspect of Jack's life at the time of her death, 
she had not consistently been active in her son's life, a fact which had caused Jack a great deal of distress as a child and resulted in years of resentment towards his mother. Jack's father, William Graham, had been Daisy's second husband. He died when Jack was three years old, although he had separated from Daisy more than a year before his death. Jack had been sent to live with his grandmother following his parents' separation so that his mother could take what work she could find during the Great Depression, and his half-sister Helen was taken in by a religious school. After Jack's grandmother passed away, he was sent to the Clayton College for Boys, an orphanage for fatherless boys in Denver. While the orphanage was considered progressive at the time and offered the boys who lived there an education and some degree of freedom, Jack wanted to be reunited with his mother, Daisy. Daisy's financial situation improved greatly in 1941 when she married a wealthy rancher named Earl King. Jack ran away from the orphanage to try to reunite with his mother several times, but she would always send him back. Jack was allowed to spend holiday breaks with his mother at his stepfather's ranch, but would always be sent back to the orphanage when classes started again. The amount of time and money Daisy would put into her relationship with her son as he got older seemingly did little to make up for her absence from his younger life. The number of lives he would take in his pursuit of revenge against his mother meant nothing to Jack. Jack was aware that 50 or 60 people could be carried on the plane, but the number of people to be killed made no difference to me, he would later tell prison psychiatrists. It could have been a thousand. When their time comes, there is nothing they can do about it. In 1955, there were no federal laws prohibiting the bombing of a commercial aircraft. The only charge the FBI could bring against Jack Graham was sabotaging an aircraft during peacetime. On November 14, 1955, a special agent from the FBI filed a complaint before the U.S. Commissioner in Denver, charging Jack Graham with sabotage. Jack could not make his bond and remained in custody. However, this charge carried a maximum sentence of 10 years, hardly an acceptable prison term for a bombing that took 44 lives. Therefore, federal authorities agreed to turn Jack over to the state of Colorado. On November 17th, he was charged in the state court with the murder of his mother and held without bond. While this single murder charge did not address the full scope of the crimes Jack committed, it would make him eligible for the death penalty, were he successfully convicted of it. The bombing of United 629 did not go exactly as Jack had planned. The plane had taken off 22 minutes later than scheduled because it was waiting for a passenger. Harold Sandstead, President Eisenhower's Deputy Secretary for Public Health, was booked on United 629. He had been traveling to make a speech at the University of Oregon. His flight into Denver from Washington, D.C. had been delayed, so United 629 waited in Denver until he arrived and made his connection. If United 629 had taken off on schedule, the timer would have gone off and the bomb would have exploded while the plane was over the Medicine Bow Mountains. United had lost another plane to a crash on October 6, 1955, when United 409 crashed into Medicine Bow Peak, killing all 66 people on board. United had also lost two other planes in that mountain range in the past decade. If the plane had gone down in the mountains, the crash site may not have been accessible until the following spring, compromising the evidence and potentially obscuring the true cause of the crash. The ongoing investigation after Jack's arrest would show that he had begun making preparations to bring down United 629 within days of the most recent United crash in the mountains. Jack had approached the owner of an electrical company asking for a job, which he said he would work for only a nominal amount of money in hopes of gaining more experience in the electrical field. The owner agreed to employ Jack for a week, and when that term was over, Jack asked him several questions about how to obtain a timer that worked with a battery and did not go beyond two hours. The owner advised him on what to ask for at the appliance store. Authorities were also able to track down the locations where Jack had purchased the various components of the bomb, like the dynamite, and the merchants were able to identify Jack or pick his picture out of a lineup as the person they had sold the materials to in October of 1955. Investigators also learned that Jack had ranted to a credit manager from Chevrolet about how easy it would be to blow up a plane and how he had observed the baggage handling operation at Stapleton Airport and believed getting a bomb on board a plane would be a simple endeavor. He made these statements after being unable to pay the $50 deductible 
on his insurance policy following his truck being hit by a train. In the incident, he would later admit to have orchestrated intentionally. He told the credit manager he could not make the payment because his bank account was a joint account with his mother and the funds were tied up. According to Jack's half-sister Helen, following the plane crash, Jack had made jokes both to her and to Gloria Graham about the shotgun shells in their mother's luggage going off inside of the plane and everyone on board jumping around to avoid them before the plane went down. Such insensitive remarks from her half-brother had not been shocking to Helen, however, as for the past several years she had not wanted to be around Jack because she knew him to be mentally unstable and violent. Jack had lived with Helen and her husband for a time in Alaska after he found a job there, and he had relayed to her one day that after he grew frustrated because he was having difficulty loosening a bolt from a piece of equipment, he had instead found a stick of dynamite and simply blown it off. Jack had also attacked Helen on two separate occasions. He had tried to attack her with a hammer before she was able to lock herself in a room to get away from him on one, and he had knocked her down on the other, kneeing her in the chest with such force that it damaged her ribs. Just a few months before the plane crash, Helen had witnessed Jack exhibit similar violent and irrational behavior towards his wife Gloria. Jack had gone to sleep, and Gloria was not with him when he woke up. She had been playing cards with Helen and Daisy. When Jack found her, he hit her several times and made his mother fear that he would strike her as well. While Jack confessed to the bombing, he quickly changed his story, recanting the confession in an interview that appeared in the Rocky Mountain News just four days after he made it. Jack was arraigned on the murder charge in Denver District Court on December 9, 1955, and entered pleas of innocent and innocent by reason of insanity before, during, and after the alleged commission of the crime. However, only pleas of innocent and innocent by reason of insanity at the time of the alleged crime were accepted by the court. Jack was then sent to a psychiatric hospital, where he was ordered to be examined by four psychiatrists, two chosen by his defense team and two appointed by the court. During one of these evaluations, he maintained his innocence and provided a bizarre explanation as to why he had said he was responsible for bombing United 629. Jack claimed that he had gotten the idea to confess to bombing the plane with dynamite from a picture hanging in the office he had been in at the time. The picture showed FBI agents digging up a hidden supply of explosives after apprehending Nazi saboteurs in Florida during World War II. All four psychiatrists found Jack to be legally sane. Jack was then returned to the Denver County Jail, where he remained for several weeks and was a model prisoner. However, he then attempted suicide on February 10, 1956, and was transferred to the psychiatric ward at Colorado General Hospital. During his time at the hospital, Jack reverted back to taking credit for the bombing of United 629. He was very open with his psychiatrist about his guilt in the crime, his motives for committing it, his feelings, or lack thereof, about killing so many people, and the details of how he had carried out the bombing. Jack did not change his plea in court, however, and his trial began in April of 1956. The case set a Colorado state record for the number of jurors examined for a trial, with 231 jurors questioned before the 12 jurors, seven men and five women, were selected. A major contributing factor to this large number of potential jurors was the extensive coverage the case had in the media, which had led to many people already having a firm opinion about Jack's guilt or innocence. Public interest in the case was still high when the trial began, with members of all forms of the media making special preparations to cover it. The trial was one of the first in the United States in which television cameras were allowed inside of the courtroom, although they were not allowed to broadcast live. Every day, hundreds of people spent hours waiting outside the courtroom clamoring for a seat inside. The guard at the door did save one seat every day for a young woman who arrived promptly at 9 a.m. each day of the trial. She was the widow of one of the pilots of United 629. The prosecution called more than 80 witnesses and entered 174 exhibits into evidence. Jack's initial five-page confession was read aloud in court and witnesses provided testimony about his contradictory statements and incriminating purchases. Members of the ground crew at the airport confirmed that the plane had been in proper working order at takeoff, and members of the Civil Aeronautics Board, representatives of the Douglas Aircraft Corporation, and employees of United Airlines detailed the collection and preservation of the pieces of wreckage from the crash site 
and how they had determined where the explosion had originated. An expert from the FBI laboratory testified to the laboratory's identification of the chemical residue and battery fragments. The prosecution's case was detailed and thorough. The defense case was far less robust, and they only had eight witnesses to call. With few other options, Jack's lawyers did attempt to have evidence and testimony from the FBI excluded from the trial. On the ninth day of the trial, they were granted a hearing in federal court, during which they argued that the evidence provided by the FBI had been illegally obtained because Jack had not been advised of his rights before he was questioned and his property was searched. FBI agents testified that he had been advised of his rights and provided eight waivers signed by Jack before any searches were conducted. The judge dismissed the motion, and the proceedings in state court continued. Jack Graham had made grandiose claims to the press before his trial began about how his testimony would refute all of the evidence against him and prove his innocence. He ultimately did not testify at the trial. On May 4, 1956, the jury returned with a verdict after deliberating for just 69 minutes. They found Jack Gilbert Graham guilty of his mother's murder. He was sentenced to die in the gas chamber. Jack's conviction did little to ruin the calm and disinterested mood he had maintained throughout his trial. It also failed to inspire any pity for his victims in him. Following his conviction, he told a reporter from Time Magazine, As far as feeling remorse for those people, I don't. I can't help it. Everybody pays their way and takes their chances. That's just the way it goes. Jack had seemingly no interest in delaying his execution, but his attorneys filed motions and appeals on his behalf against his wishes. When they tried to get Jack a new trial, Jack took the stand and told the judge he did not want a new trial or for his conviction to be reviewed by the state Supreme Court. Jack's execution was stayed after his attorneys filed another appeal without his consent, but the Colorado Supreme Court upheld Jack's conviction and set his execution for January of 1957. While the bombing of United 629 would have a profound and devastating impact on the loved ones its passengers left behind for the rest of their lives, the life of the man responsible for it would end just 14 months after the plane was brought down. On Friday, January 11, 1957, Jack was taken to the gas chamber at the Colorado State Penitentiary. He was stripped down to his underwear, had a black mask placed over his eyes, and was strapped to a steel chair. Warden Harry Tinsley said God blessed Jack after he strapped him to the chair, and Jack responded with thank you. After the gas was released into the chamber, Jack began coughing and then screaming before succumbing to the gas. He died 11 minutes after the gas entered the chamber, his death mirroring the deaths of his 44 victims, who were senselessly killed when an explosion brought down their plane 11 minutes after it took off.